Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to the Photo Brigade podcast. My name is Robert Kaplan. I'm with my friend Mohammed El Shami. El, El Shami, I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. Dang it, I did it. I even like practice it. Mohammed El Shami, how you doing, Mohammed? I'm good. How are you doing? I'm good. Thank you. Did you get that tweeted out or, or uh, Facebooked out? Yeah. I, I, okay. I well, I we're trying to let people know that we are now live on Facebook. Um, so thank you all for tuning in. Uh, before we get started here, I just want to give a quick shout out to uh, Adorama for letting us use their event space to record our weekly podcast. Very cool. Thank you so much. Also to uh, Canon Professional Services for all of your support, as well as Tenba Bags. Um, if you're watching on Facebook, um, you know there's, I believe, a subscribe button or a way that you can get our updates to, to let you know that we are live on Facebook when we go live. So be sure to hit that. Um, also, everything we do is on Facebook. All we, you know, we, we post so much material, really great content. So if you go to our Facebook page, facebookcom photobrigade um, Hit, this, hit the like button, and then also, um, if you can, rate us. You know, we've got a rating system. We'd love to have your, your feedback and your, your five stars. Um, so with no further ado, get back to Mohammed. How you doing, my man? I'm good. How are you doing? Today? I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. I, uh, so I think we need to give a little background on, on you and I. Um, you and I met actually here in New York City at a yeah. Beer and Wings event. Yeah. I think that's what it was, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, the first time was. The first time we met at, at uh, there's a, a, a monthly almost monthly uh, event here in New York where photojournalists get together and they have they um, you know just drink and, and network and so on and and uh, I don't remember who it was that introduced me to you maybe it was Michael Ipp or so, I don't um, know it could have I been think Mark uh, I don't know someone <laughs> anyways it could have been anybody um, but Mo Mohammed and I also met in uh, at the Eddie Adams workshop afterwards you were a student um, and so, so to sort of give a little bit of background on on you you're an Egyptian photographer and you are 22, um, and you've been covering some of, I don't know, some of the most difficult circumstances, I think. Uh, there are obviously always worse situations to, to shoot, <laughs> but um, I don't know. You're, you're on that cusp of uh, shooting some of the most dire um, events in the world, such as the Ebola crisis, the Egyptian um, political unrest in Egypt, uh, Darfur, so on and so forth. The, the immigrant crisis going on right now in Europe. Um, so you've been keeping busy, to say the least. Yeah. Yeah. I've been like, um, I've been working since um, early 2011. Uh -huh. I started uh, with an internship in, in a newspaper in Egypt uh -huh. called Al Masri Liom. Then um, I then got a job with them. I and before the before the internship, did you did you shoot? Like I actually like it's funny I actually liked video or mm -hmm. like I wanted to do video, uh, video journalism. Video journalism. I'm gonna go through some photos as we talk. <laughs> but then I just I don't know I uh, I decided no this is not what I want to do and I just got the internship without like uh, yeah I didn't take like I didn't study it in the university. You didn't study it or university. You just kind of had a natural talent for getting out there. You, I mean. <laughs> I mean, you know, you're getting right in people's faces, you know, this is, I mean, there, you have to have a little bit of, I don't know, gusto or whatever to, to get out there and, and like cover these types of events. So uh, what is this just because you, you started documenting it because it's your, your, your home and you just want to document what's happening around you or, or what's... I, I mean, like I, uh, I, I felt um, with everything happening in Egypt, like I come from a family who cares about politics and news and two out of my older three brothers are journalists. So like we care about what's happening around us. We absolutely uh, and like even my father is a humanitarian worker. So like since we were all young, we cared about this and um, I felt like when reading newspapers and seeing pictures, this had a stronger impact on people rather than like any other right. usual job, right. like, which you just see. There's just something about visuals that relate to the, the viewer better than words ever can. I mean, obviously a, a wonderful writer can, can uh, paint a picture in words, but um, being able to capture the emotion uh, and the strife and all that stuff is, is something very different. Um, so 
you and you, you say you never had any formal training yeah i mean like um i started with the internship in the newspaper then i got a job with them and then i uh, year and a half later i moved to the turkish news agency um then i started having like um kind of um I was chosen to participate in the Magnum Foundation Human Rights uh, oh, right. Photography. Yeah. So you've won all sorts of awards as well for this work that you've, I mean, I know you, you're you shy, you don't want to talk <laughs> about it and stuff, but it's true. You, you've, you've won some awards, Magnum Foundation, you've, um, the, the Chris Hondros um, award, was is it a grant? Yeah, it was a grant. It's a grant, which you got at Eddie Adams Workshop. Yeah. Um, and so that was, that's pretty amazing. So let's talk about Eddie Adams Workshop a little bit because that's actually going to be happening yeah, in like a in a week days, yeah. or, or something next week. So basically, um, the Eddie Adams Workshop, as we've talked about on many occasions here in um, on the podcast, is a workshop in upstate New York. Gets a hundred different photographers. You, uh, half are students, half are early professionals. Uh, small percentage are actually like uh, military um, photographers and so on. And they break them up in 10 teams of 10 and, and you were there. And at the end of the workshop, after shooting, everyone shoots assignments and so on. And everybody gets to, you know, really interact with their um, instructors and, and so on. And then those instructors nominate different photographers for awards. There are many awards. And one of the awards is the Chris Hondros uh, Fund Award. And Chris Hondros was actually a friend of mine. Um, and he was killed in... Um, where was it? Was he in Libya? Libya, in Misrata. Lib yeah, yeah in, in Misrata. And, uh, and so there's a, been a fun put together. So you ended up winning that. And um, I'm curious how those type of awards and grants help photographers like you continue telling your story. And, and, and I think it's like um, it makes you feel like you've achieved something um, and actually... Uh, what you've been covering in, in neglected countries like Sierra Leone or Nigeria or Egypt, uh, that people actually care about it. It's not just like other wire pictures that go on the wire and people forget it. Mm -hmm. So when you have this kind of rec recognition, I think it's, Yanni, it, uh, it makes you feel like you've achieved something right. um, and that it was worth the, the risk that at least these people their stories are being told and they've been seen. So we're looking now at photos that you took um, of the Ebola crisis yeah. recently. This was last year, two years ago, or uh, maybe even three years ago now? I'm 2014. 2014, so two years ago, going on three years yeah. ago. How do you get, the, get up the nerve uh, to, to actually go into a zone like this where you know, people are dying from an illness that you could very potentially catch. I'm, I'm just, I mean, I, I'm, I'm being serious. I mean, there's, there's, it, it takes, you know, something to put yourself at risk to tell these stories. Um, I think it's, it's, uh, it comes from my background. Like I have spent most of my life in Nigeria in West Africa where my father works. Um, and when the Ebola started, I felt like um, not many people were, were eager to go there. And it was an assignment I chose. Like I wasn't asked to do it. So I pitched it to my editors. And because I, I felt like if everyone's scared, then no one's going to do it. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Did you run into any other photographers as you were doing this? Because uh, you really got into these villages that are very far removed, yeah? Yeah. I uh, In Sierra Leone, I don't remember but in Liberia I met John Moore which was like was awesome oh, yeah. he, there you go <laughs> he helped me a lot in fixing me with these guys and like this this guy like no with with the the burial teams oh the, I see yeah. I see gotcha um, that's another thing we should mention about our industry um, photojournalism in terms of photography is one of the closest smallest uh, groups I mean if you don't know someone personally, you know someone very well that knows that person very exactly. well. That's just the way it is. Yeah. That's how we met. You know, that's <laughs> just how, how these things happen. Um, ha, you know, with regards to the Eddie Adams workshop, meeting John here um, and helping you out, have you found that there's been an no, amazing... Actually, like, the, the funny thing is, as you said, like, it was uh, Jim Estrin, and he connected me to John. Oh, Jim, and, yeah. And I met John after, uh, like, I never met him before helping me. 
Oh, okay, like, I gotcha. After he connected me. With oh, okay, I see. So we met in Liberia, but after... you basically met to thank him. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, <so>. that's wonderful. <laughs> well, so Jim Estrin, we should talk about a little bit. Is yeah. uh, he, he works at the New York Times, yeah. been a staff photographer for, I don't know, 30-ish years, or maybe more. Um, and he runs the Lens Blog, kind of was one of the co-founders of the Lens Blog. And he was, while I was an intern at the Times, he was one of my main uh, mentors. I mean, couldn't be a nicer guy to sit down and talk, it gives you so much time and so on. Um, so do you, how did you know, how did you meet Jim? Um, I met him in 2014 in May mm -hmm. uh, during the Magnum Foundation. Uh, oh, okay, so he was there for that. Uh, no, like after the the classes, we get to go to like Times, New York Times, and oh, okay. Al Jazeera America back then. Oh, okay, uh, which so is gone now. Yeah, <laughs> unfortunately. So we like I met him then, and I I met him a year later in the New York Times portfolio review and. He okay. Was, he, like he's really helpful. His were you <laughs> at this this last year's one? Two thousand fifteen. Two thousand fifteen. Yeah, 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 I went to the first New York Times Portfolio Review this last year, two thousand sixteen. What a cool thing! Yeah, it's. Perfect. I had no idea <laughs> what it was like, and and I, I, Photo Shelter asked me to come and give him a hand, you know, and do whatever needed, and I went around, took pictures, ended up helping look at a few portfolios because you know how it is. Sometimes <laughs> you're there and you're just waiting, and everyone just wants their portfolio looked at and yeah. some feedback. Um, so. Do you feel that those types of events, like portfolio reviews and things like that, has that led to work for you at all or contacts? Like, I mean, it's like because I uh, I work as a staff with uh, an Adulo agency, so I basically don't work with other outlets. Mm -hmm. um, but it really led to good contacts, like people who at least can give me a good edit selection. Right. If like I'm I'm working on a story and I. I don't know which pictures to choose. I just right. Admit, like right, right, right. You ha have them. There look are many over. good people I met. Yeah, um, and so that brings me to another point, which is you're from Egypt. You've been working in Africa for so long, um, and all over Europe. Um, but now you're based in New York. I didn't even realize that. I thought you were just here for a, a spell, and that's why I was like, let's get on the podcast before you're gone again. But you're here now. Yeah. <laughs> well, what's the scoop? You just decided. Like, did the agency decide uh, to bring you yeah. here? They they decided to move me here and is it because of your command your command for english like i i mean <laughs> like was it because you wanted to did you let them know that no it was just like they it just they decided yeah they, cool and, and you're a nomad so you can go wherever you want it's okay i think like you know surviving other places you're gonna survive new york yeah <laughs> <laughs> that's well i mean yeah that's right if you can survive where you've been you can survive new york that's for sure um okay so uh and while you're here in New York, you're working for the agency of Turkish news agency, Turkish Anadolu. What's it called? Anadolu. A Anadolu? Anadolu, yeah. Um, and what kind of work are you covering here in New York? I mean, like, since I came, it's it's been a very hectic month. I mean, <laughs> Well, you had the UN. <laughs> yeah, the UN are? and uh, the parades and the bomb. And it's funny, like, I, I was... I thought this is gonna be like the safest place. <laughs> and you're, it's like, <laughs> like train accidents, <laughs> bombs. Yeah, and like, the, like the house in Bronx that burned last week. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. Oh, like, the marijuana uh, grow operation that killed someone. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, unfortunately. So it's like, uh, it's just it's everything. It's and so you, well. I, I noticed on Facebook, you posted some photos from the UN, the General Assembly, or something along yeah. those lines. I don't know if it was General Assembly, but but going from the streets, literally, as a, as a kid to the, the streets of Egypt covering this unrest, to the world stage in, in New York City. That's a pretty big deal, isn't yeah, it, for you? It's, I mean, it's seeing totally all the leaders. different. I mean, like, I, like, I, uh, I always tell my brother, like, if you told me a year ago I'm gonna be based in New York, I'm like, you're kidding me, you know? Yeah, <laughs> and you're liking it where in New York are you living, exactly? Uh, uh, at the moment, I'm in Queens. In Queens, okay. I'm looking for a place. <laughs> so if the only place, place in the world fit for a king <laughs> is Queens. <laughs> <laughs> That's my coming to America joke, everyone. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so anyhow, I want to go continue going through these photos of yours, um, which I, I need to get off the light note there because it's going to go right back into deep stuff. But... but um, this portfolio that we're looking through was actually a portfolio that you put together for the Chris Andros uh, grant, right? Uh, or similar yeah, it's to? Like it's uh, it's a collection I applied for. This is okay. Yeah, gotcha. 
Um, Some pictures I actually took in after I won the grant, so oh, I see. It's like a collection more. Did what? What's going through your mind when you when you go into situations like this? I'm. I mean, I, 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 are you stealth? Are you noticeable? Do do people notice you? Are they weirded out by it? Do you just kind of walk by, take a snap, and move by? Like how 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 does it work for you? I mean, there's like. It's uh, it's a joke, but it's true. Like when I, when I'm in Nigeria, everyone thinks I'm a foreigner stealing their resources, working in petroleum. Like when I'm in Europe or New or like United States, people think I'm a migrant. So oh. <laughs> people are always freaking out of me. Um, but in Nigeria, because I like I've been there for many years, and uh, like their pidgin language, the the language they use together, I know how to speak it. So oh, okay. When when I chat with them in that language, they're like, ah, okay, you, you know, you know us. You're not just like right. a foreigner working petroleum, blah blah right. blah. So they but they there's get a stereotype. Yeah, there is. I mean, like it's it's definitely when when they see you with the with like uh, with a the camera, they just think you're <laughs> coming to just yeah, document and leave. Um, wh- so when can you remember? When the first time you had something published that made you go, this is it for me. Like, I'm going to be a photo- I mean, obviously, you're working for the uh, Egyptian. Was it the agency in Egy- uh, Egypt or a paper? No, it was a newspaper. It was a newspaper. So that was big for you to get your pictures in the yeah, newspaper. Um, when was the first time you got your photos out on a world stage? Like it really was like on uh, in December 2011. Um, I took a picture. I think it's here. But Coming up? Or no, I think it's in the back. Backwards? Yeah, um, like have we? Okay. I don't know. You can control it. Can I like just uh, bang no, no, through no, no, them? No, 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 no. Back here. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it's okay. Yeah, I uh, this, I shot this when I was seventeen in two thousand eleven, uh-huh. and I, I won the Egypt Press Award, the first place. That's right. You were the youngest to win yeah. this award. <laughs> so like then I was like, yeah, I'm gonna do this. You're I gonna <laughs> do this. <laughs> and and that's pretty that's pretty wild. And you were interning or working for this no, newspaper I at that point. I was working by that time that was like december 2011 uh-huh have you been scared of shooting course. photos <laughs> like what what would you say is one of the more frightening instances of being covering this type of work yeah i think it's okay to be scared like of course i get scared because especially in um uh, like in egypt or other countries in the middle east we uh <laughs> it's like when you tell people about what happens in Egypt or how uh the protests are dealt with people don't believe it like that you could <laughs> like a protest could be dispersed and and tens dying in a day you know it's uh of course you get scared to die because have you're you, have human you beings. Yeah. One <laughs> of the things that we're going to talk about in this podcast on a very serious note is the the effect that covering these type of events has on you and other photographers, right? Yeah. Um, which, I mean, I, I can't relate with. I just can't because I just haven't covered this kind of stuff. Um, I can only imagine and I can only give kudos to those who do this type of work. But can you give me an idea of of what kind of uh, mental stresses or even physical um, issues have come from covering things like this? <laughs> um, I mean, like, I think this definitely affects us as photographers or journalists because we're human beings. We we just don't, yeah, I, I, I don't believe photojournalism or journalism is just like, having an office job where you you spend your eight hours and go home and that's it but we actually um we're actually seeing like people die we're actually seeing people injured we're seeing people like starving especially like when you see refugees or malnutrition people who who don't have the like don't eat you know like like all these people like this was in south sudan like people are standing for hours just to get clean water which is something like we take for granted. We, we all take for granted, we, and we crap into <laughs> clean water here in America. It's, it's and like uh, it, it, 
it definitely it definitely affects us because um, I think we're attached and like especially when I see this happening to my country to my country yeah. or when I was covering the Syrian refugees in Europe it's like I was the only thing on my mind was like these people are just like me we speak like the same language we looked alike and there's no difference that only these people are barrel bombed by their government and the regime and I was lucky enough not to be so I it, it really affects on on a short and a long term and it, it does it does make many people diagnosed by PTSD and GAD and <laughs> you, you yourself have that <laughs> I, I don't mean to get too personal but we talked about talking about this beforehand <laughs> and we don't have to if you don't want to remember just I mean, touch your nose yeah, if you I mean don't want it's to uh, like I I get nightmares from things I've seen um, it comes often like even I if I'm here in America I'm still getting flashbacks of like the sirens listening to sirens on the day of the Chelsea bombing it it reminded me of like the the brutal dispersal dispersal of Rabia al Adawiya, which was on the 14th of August 2013, mm -hmm. where like over 800 died, and for many hours I had to listen to like the sirens so loud. Mm -hmm. And in the Chelsea bombings, it happened again. It was like for four or five hours. Mm -hmm. I was like, shit, this is happening again. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No so good. yeah, the their flashbacks, their nightmares, and their, but. I think if like we as photographers survive the the horror and the tra tragedy, I think we're gonna survive the post trauma. Yeah, well, that's a good. That's that's it's nice actually to hear. Um, okay, so you you talk about you know seeing your fellow um, Egyptian countrymen go through this. How? You know, I I'm American. I grew up here and I grew up in Ohio and then in New York City. I'm sort of the epitome of white privilege. I you know, I can't imagine what it was like. How 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 would you say that you were affected personally and maybe your family as well by just what was going on in your country that started your photography career? I mean, like when I actually um, when I actually started, I like there wasn't really anything huge happening in Egypt. There were just some major protests, uh -huh. like tw 10, 20 people taking to the streets against Mubarak. Um, that was like when I started thinking and, and started having training. That was like in 2008 when I I went to uh, Jesuit. It's a Catholic school, I think, in Ramses, uh -huh. Cairo, for video journalism. Back then, there was nothing much happening, but I was inspired by like things happening in the Middle East, by all the conflicts happening. Mm -hmm. Um, so by then there, wa there wasn't really something happening, but in 2011 with the, with the uprising and everything happening, I was like, no, I think we all need to, to do this. And it was a good chance, like there is a generation of photographers in Egypt, which was only inspired by the, the protest. Right. Took down Hosni Mubarak, but <laughs> it's, not, it's not much better, is it? I mean, it's just it's 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 like you look back at all of these different wars and, and conflicts that are happening almost anywhere, and it seems that no matter how bad it was to start, it just gets worse, right? I yeah. mean, I don't know. Take me you back to 2011. <laughs> and who would have thought that? You yeah, know? I mean, like no, even like the the most negative person wouldn't imagine that the countries would be this way now mm -hmm. you know it's yeah and um so speaking of egypt you had mentioned before we got in about other photographers that have been arrested can we talk a little bit about that yeah um i mean like um it's unfortunate that um there are many colleagues and like journalists and photojournalists who are being in jail since 2013 since the coup d'etat and one of them, I think, is well known here, even in the States, uh, Mahmoud Abdul Shakur, mm -hmm. uh, w w well known as Shao Khan. He has been in jail for like over three years, uh, three years, yeah, since 14th of August 2013 till today. He's mm -hmm. in jail without a trial and just without anything. Being unheard just of from just gone. And it's it's a heartbreak because um, like I have seen him. In, in the prison 
Uh, You've yeah. seen him in the yeah, prison. Yeah, I've seen okay. him in the prison, and you just feel helpless for him because he was arrested with two foreign journalists. One was a Canadian, and one was French, I think. Uh-huh. They were both released, and he is still in jail, like till today. And it's awful. It's uh, things like this just make you, you know, like lose hope in in many aspects of life that he doesn't deserve it i i don't think anyone deserves to be in a high security prison in egypt for taking photos or for his ideas or for anything i and him and many other journalists like abdullah al-fakharani samhi mustafa muhammad al-adli there there are many i mean like (laughs) i can't name all of them but like these ones i'm saying at least i know them personally and and some of them are on hunger strike and but unfortunately it, it just seems like no one cares uh and no one wants to do anything to i'm so i mean curious like what what is there to do like what what could what could people do do you think um just uh getting the word out there talking about it like wh- I'm, 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 what I, proactive things could be done do you think well i think yeah I mean, it's hard it's a hard one i mean <laughs> The thing is, like, in, in, in the, the atmosphere in Egypt doesn't even allow people to protest or do anything. So I think the, the committees to that actually care about human rights and about detentions, they should do more pressure on the countries supporting the Egyptian regime, mm-hmm. the military junta in Egypt, mm-hmm. to free these people. Because you don't gain anything from, from imprisoning them. You, you literally gain nothing. Mm-hmm. It's just like, just let them out. I mean, <laughs> right, right. <laughs> These people are like, they are journalists or photographers. There is no any evidence that they committed any crime. So why keep them? Yeah. No reason. Ay, ay, ay. Um, so let's move on. We started looking at some of these, uh, <laughs> these photos from, this is from this is the Lebanon. Uh, oh, this is Lebanon. The okay. Syrian we've Syrian refugee camps. Okay. T- let's talk about that a little bit. When did you go here? Um, this was in July 2016. Two oh, months just ago. recently. <laughs> yeah. This is some recent work yeah. then. We're towards the end here. Okay. Um, and what drew you here? Um, so actually, I was uh, I was trying to do a story about the, the refugees living in homes that were destroyed during the civil war mm-hmm. in Lebanon. Mm-hmm. So I, uh, I did this in Beirut. I think the next picture or the one after. Uh, next no. one. No, no. Back? <laughs> you take it. <laughs> take control. <laughs> sorry. Uh, no, I think now it's mixed. Okay, it's mixed so now. Okay, sorry about okay, this. Okay, we're going to go through it. But um, <laughs> So I, I decided to do it in Beirut and in Al-Biqa to show like the ones who are actually living in... Uh, He's bombed in, out. In yeah. yeah. The places that were destroyed during the civil war and now. Okay. And uh, the people just living in normal places like this. And how long did you um, stay there? Um, I've worked on it for almost a month. Okay. In like Beirut, Baqa, Beirut, Baqa. It's like Lebanon is a very small country, so <laughs> right. <laughs> you can just go around. Oh, sorry, oh, two hours. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. They've got shocks on them. <laughs> um, okay, so, and and this was just before then you moved here to New York. When yeah. did you move to New York? I moved uh, on the first of September. First of September. So, so one you're month, one, one month. Day. Welcome to New York, by the <laughs> Thank way. You. Uh, hopefully. Uh, so. <clears throat> okay. So. What do you what do you see is in your future in the, in the next year? Would you say do you, do you see yourself just hanging in New York covering general New York City politics and news and, and so on? Or is it do you think you're going to be doing a lot more travel like you used to? Do you think you're on a hiatus from that for a bit? Do you think you need that? I mean, mentally, just to like take a break from it all. Is this a good thing for you? Um, well, if. Like there are no bombs, there are no train crashes and everything, <laughs> then it's it's gonna be good. But right. Um, I think what I'm gonna concentrate on is the elections because that's like the biggest story in the world now. Oh right, of course the elections. And like till it's finished, I think maybe I could do some like I actually wanna like go through America itself. Oh, and do like a story of like Americans. I just haven't Americans. been to many states yet. So I, I, I think there's I'm a lot of different difference between where you've been, New York and middle America. I can tell you yeah. that much. It's it's pretty staggering. I just went to Ohio to visit my family. And um, here in New York, it's mostly Clinton, Clinton, Clinton signs. <laughs> and even in, you know, pockets of 
of Ohio, it's Clinton, Clinton, Clinton. But then taking a road trip through Ohio, it's you know, all Trump. It's just like very s separated. You know, you go through this territory, it's all you know, Republican, conservative. The other way, it's liberal. So it'd be an interesting story for you to. <laughs> and, and you talk about stereotyping. I mean, who knows what you could encounter even in America here? You know, you've have you found that at all being here in America, being stereotyped or had any kind of issues yeah, I mean, with like that? It's uh it happens, but um, like I don't think I've been through it a lot because like for the last weeks I've been just like working nonstop, so I haven't had time to to be stereotyped. <laughs> well, that's good. That's <laughs> so good. That's good. But like sometimes people like ask where you're from, or when I speak Arabic, and like some way, or like people freak out. Like, why are you saying? But yeah, it's not a lot. It's, it's not a lot. I think because New York is more open-minded than other cities. That's and true. Like it's diverse. That's true. Just like Canada. Look at this work that this yeah. lady does. Yeah. I mean, you wouldn't see this ever in America, you know? <laughs> like, uh, so what is the backstory behind this um, set this of photos? This is a uh, woman who worked uh, in brick depots in Sudan, mm -hmm. in Darfur, northern Sudan. They work for, um, I think, five days and they get paid two or three dollars a oh. day or a week. Sorry. Oh my gosh. And like they live in very like homes built from blocks like this and those are just like mu it's like mud or something. Yeah, it's all mud. So um it's unfortunate for this to happen, but uh it's happening. Like this is Aisha Abdullah, the main character in the story. I s I went to her place for a few days and uh, what was it like living with her for a few days? <laughs> you just remember to be grateful for things you have. <laughs> that uh, yeah, I don't think you could say that any better. I mean, couldn't imagine. And do they all yeah, live together here? Yeah, this is like her and her daughter, her mother, and they're all in this hut. Mm -hmm. If you want to call that that, yeah. Um, so yeah, this is the. So Lebanon one. This, these oh, are now houses we're back to yeah, we're out of order. Okay, so that were uh, destroyed during the civil war in uh -huh, Lebanon, uh -huh. in Beirut. Uh, so now Syrian refugees shelter in those places. Uh huh. Have you? I've noticed like the New York Times and other outlets starting to use like virtual reality and different types of uh, you know social media and so on. Um, have you taken? use of that I mean obviously you have an Instagram uh, which we can certainly pull up here uh, an Instagram account uh, uh, El Shami me <laughs> um, where you post some of your work here um, everyone should go follow follow him but um, what's your thought on sort of the new world of social media and technology these days um, actually the first time I ever ch uh, use a VR was Last month, uh, end of August, there was a workshop for Magnum Foundation in Lebanon. Mm -hmm. I think it's it's really a good idea. I mean, it's it's a very good technology to mm -hmm. make you actually like see the place, see I, what I, it's like. I've seen one piece by Ben Solomon in Iraq. Uh -huh. It was mind blowing. And how did you watch <laughs> it? Uh, With the the, the cardboard? Oh, the Samsung, yeah, the Samsung gear. Yeah. Okay. It was like it was. Awesome. It's wild. I remember when the New York Times app came out and you got the Google Cardboard with that. Yeah. And there was a story similar to what you're doing of it was the children in all these different yeah, war torn I've, I've places. Seen that too, yeah. And you just in see the these kids like playing in the rubble like you were just showing, um, which blows my mind. I mean, I couldn't imagine seeing a place like that. E even here in America, yeah, there's definitely some rundown places and people shouldn't be living in these type of places but it's nothing compared to what you see and until you are actually standing whether physically or virtually in that place you really don't get an idea for what it's like so you think you think that vr I is good i think it's it's very good i mean i i wish i do one piece in the future of so that's something that you probably will end up taking I up. well i mean you said that you started in video yeah like that was do you do you do any video now or? i do but like when when i have to when, when you I have to when <laughs> right 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 because it's more of a it's more of a pain to be honest right yeah it just is 
with respect to all phot videographers. <laughs> I, no, I, I, it's, 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 it's just, you know, you're shooting 24, 30 frames a second versus, you know, however many we're yeah. taking. And then you have to edit all those at the end, which is, I found shooting video, the editing process is the hardest. And especially if you're doing it in the news capacity and having to turn it around, you know, almost real time, uh, it's a bit of a stress. So, um, so what else? What else is uh, what else is going on in your what world? Else? You tell me. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, so since you've been in New York, you've been super busy with working. Obviously, have you had time off to network, go to different events, or do different things, or has it just been work, work, work so far? Well, it's it's mostly been work, but. Um Work and looking for a place. So and looking for yeah. a place. So are you doing one of these things where you're subletting temporarily at some uh, location? No, I'm, I'm with a friend till... You're till crashing on a couch yeah. for now? <laughs> gotcha. Um, Understood. And go backwards. We're going to go yeah. backwards into some, some recent work here. So were these last few sh shots were recent pictures? Yeah, these were all in July. Oh, also in July yeah. from... Oh, we were at the end yeah. of, the, of it as well. Um, yeah. Um, so, okay. So... I'm curious, being a being 22, I was 22 once. That was when I actually <laughs> came to New York. I was 21, 22 years old. So you're literally 12 years, 13 years younger than me. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, he <laughs> says. <laughs> thank you, yeah. Um, and uh, I mean, there's so much ahead of you, yet you had so much already. I mean, while you were, sh while you were covering unrest in Egypt and Ebola and, wa and not wars, but all this unrest and craziness, you know, I was going through college. I was taking pictures of basketball games and field hockey and, and things like that. And that goes to show sometimes and you literally a baptism by fire will get you more prepared to, to do this, do the work of a photojournalist than, you know, going through a, a four year college to, to learn the work. Um, do you feel that as you started from the time you were 17, like were you technically as savvy as you are now when you were 17 or do you feel you've just sort of, just the practice and learning the cameras, you've gotten better and better or do you think that you just kind of knew it when going into it? No, no, I think uh, like people improve and get better. Of course, I, I don't think uh, my understanding for photography or even photography equipment now is just like five years ago. I think it's obviously like we, we learn more and we get the chance and opportunity to meet like very good people in the photo industry mm -hmm. like people who like they literally help you f for no reason like you know you think this guy has done everything in his life why would he like <laughs> sure <laughs> you know but that's what they're like, there for yeah I mean. it's like many awesome people i've met in the last four or five years they're they're always there for you to help you like in editing and like even mentally if you talk to them they they understand and they so um I think it's yeah, it's better. Do you have any desire to move it all away from this type of work and maybe do a little something different, commercial work, something less? I, I mean, you know what I mean. Like, I know that you, I, or do you feel that like you're doing this for a reason? Like, this is this is your path. Um, I think I want to do this for more years, but like, I am an Arsenal football soccer team <laughs> fan old fan 11 years mm -hmm. <laughs> so i think if i survive all this uh for many years i want to do sports photography sports for photography, arsenal actually right. so if they're looking for any <laughs> 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 just to hang out with the players and yeah i think like in i want to keep doing this for more years yeah but then i want to switch to sports photography yeah is there something um you know that could sway you to maybe not w would it what I'm, I'm, I'm just curious because I think of I okay I was in intern at the Los Angeles Times and Louis Cinco went to Iraq to be embedded during the invasion right and I was just an intern and I remember talking to him and I said and he has two kids and, or one or two kids and, and I said to him why are you doing this? You know, like, <laughs> why are you risking yourself to go cover this? Da 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 da. Um, just to kind of right and not thinking about it. And then I was done with my internship, and he ended up making a very famous photo of a soldier with a cigarette hanging out of his mouth, called the Marble Man. They called it. And I wrote him, just not even knowing if he was still in Iraq or not. And I, I wrote him just saying, "You're doing some really great work." 
and he writes me back and says, um, Robert, you know, it's funny. I was just thinking about you. I, as I was in a fox, in a, in a hole in the ground, as bullets were whizzing over my head thinking, you know, why am I here? You know, wh <laughs> what am I doing? And, and he thought back to our conversation and he says, you know, the truth is I don't know. Yeah. Now I don't, I'm not sure if that was the last time he went and covered that kind of conflict or what, but is there something that, that, that could make you short of you getting hurt? Um, that would make you think crap, like, what am I doing? Like, uh, cause I, I mean, I, I think you're a great photographer, but I worry for your safety being around this type of stuff, you know? Um, Will it have been worth it if something happened to you? You know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, like, there's a saying in Turkish. I don't know how to say it in Turkish, but it's like a human life costs one lira and a half. That's, like, less than a dollar. Mm -hmm. So, uh, like, I think it's true that it's, it's, it's easy. And I think I've seen this, like, in three situations. In Cairo, I've seen it, like, on a day. Um, bullets were literally everywhere there were snipers it was like it was like judgment day people were just falling down and <laughs> it, like I, I honestly thought it was the end of the world for me like if I felt like even if I survived this day physically then emotionally I'm not gonna survive it mm -hmm. um, I think that day I thought of like is it worth it? Um, especially like seeing that people are actually dying and nothing is actually changing, you know? And this, I think, was very apparent after the Syrian civil war or prizing, I don't know, whatever people like to call it, that tens of thousands of people have died and nothing is actually changing, you know? And like, this has been a war documented by l live streaming and 4K resolution. So, right. so I just, that was the first situation I thought like, what am I doing here? Like, mm -hmm. Or like, if I die here now, like, what's gonna happen? Nothing. So <laughs> right, <laughs> just. And I think the second time was in Sudan. Um, there was like uh, militants attacking a refugee camp. So like, we were in the UN places. So I thought like, <laughs> and if something happens to me here. Why, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, of all places that yeah, you'd want to... Like why here, not Egypt, not... <laughs> and the third time, I think, was in uh, was in Sierra Leone. Like, there was a day the the death rate was very high. And... Ebola death yeah. rate. Mm -hmm. And, like, everyone is scared. You know, you're scared even to shake hands to... You can't. Oh, yeah. You're not allowed to do anything. And you don't even know, like, if the door you're touching has been touched by someone who's Ebola positive. Right. So like, so what safety protocol did you take? It was the hygiene kits. Like they were very kind people from MSF and other uh, and WHO who told me where I can get the hygiene kits from. Because you know back then, like in August two thousand fourteen, not much people knew about it. Like mm -hmm. what what could be done? You know, this right. is not like a war where you just wear a flag jacket and and stuff. Uh, so I think it was like yeah this. This kits, I was wearing them. I had many of them, and I had boots, rain boots, and so these are called PPE. Yeah, personal protective equipment. Okay. I actually happen to know this because I one of my commercial clients here <laughs> in New York is the hospital system here, and while this was going on, um, they wanted me to document the build and training videos for doctors and nurses and patients that might end up here in New York with Ebola should it spread um, yeah, they yeah. built you know multi 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 million <laughs> dollar units here in New York City which I documented everything and just seeing how all of these things yeah can easily I spread. mean it's like yeah, how, like how do you go in a situation like this and feel safe? like your camera gear afterwards like do you have to clean it I mean I mean, yeah I uh, like I cleaned it with like cleaned everything details and stuff <laughs> yeah i uh, i wasn't really sure what to do with them but i i after going back to nigeria i cleaned everything with like do you feel that the the work you did in here sierra leone this was liberia liberia um it's like you said it was a totally different type of war you know <laughs> it was i mean it wasn't war it was yeah it was a tragedy more I think. more a tragedy that's that's more like it um <coughs> Was it more difficult, do you feel? Like, was this, seeing this, just the, the emotional? I, I see you when I'm going through these photos, wincing at some of the photos. <laughs> I mean, I, I, 
you know, I almost feel bad going through them because it's like I'm bringing you through this stuff. But no, no, it's okay. Um, was that more of a mental uh, a toll on you than yeah, like actual I mean, physical like, violence? Not any shy to say it. It's it. it yeah, I think it wasn't as hectic as physical because you know physical when you sleep like maybe you don't sleep you sleep two three hours a day for a week then when you, you're back home you sleep for a week you know mm-hmm. then the physical part is gone but the emotional part it it never goes like even three two years later you still think about it like mm-hmm. think about the people you met the people that are yeah, gone. like people where you've seen like in the high high uh, intensity unit uh-huh. then like few days later in the butchery where they were keeping people you know these people have died or you see the names on on the white uh, like when they write the names the of names the of the people on yeah so it's like uh, no it's uh <laughs> it's just yeah it's terrible well um okay. you know i think that uh, we've gone through enough of those photos <laughs> i i um am i missing anything i know that we wanted to talk about a, a handful of things i think we got through most of yeah, what we wanted okay. to talk to talk about um, but you know, I really appreciate your your coming in and talking so candidly about what we're doing today because it's you know it, it's it is what it is, right? And um, so, I guess we'll we'll end it there. Yeah. And and before we end, I just want to say thanks to uh, unless anyone else has questions in the audience, you guys have any questions that you might want to ask? Well, I just want to make a comment about your, your sure. Speaking of this, the, your courage to do this never mind. Is, uh, <laughs> Your courage is amazing, he says. Yeah. And your your statement of uh, it was worth it's worth the risk to tell the story. I think that's a very impressive uh, comment. Thank you. You know, viewing it, your your images are startling and beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. And the other question that I had, and I think you kind of covered a little bit. Uh huh. So no. let, me re- let me repeat it. He's asking about your newspaper yeah. experience. Did you get hired and then start into photography, or how'd that go? No, I think um, no, I didn't. Like one of the the people who actually like has a very huge impact on on my career is uh, Sam Diab. He's the head of uh, he's the former head of uh, photography press syndicate. He like adopted me uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> in kind in means of photography. He. Uh, like he he gave me the opportunity to learn first like to go with other photographers uh, to the streets and then a few months later when he thought i was improving he started actually paying me for the jobs i'm doing mm-hmm. so i i started training first then i got hired Great. i just want to say one more thing i'm glad that you're here <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Our audience member no. was talking about how happy he is that, that you're here to cover the politics and American uh, news because it's going to take courage to cover the Trump campaign and the Clinton campaign and all, all of what's going on. Because like you said, it's uh, it's a different type of uh, yeah. news cycle here. Um, just it's a bit crazy, but different type of crazy. And sure. some literally crazy. <laughs> <Yeah>. No. <laughs> yeah. you're, I don't you're speak unbiased. about politics. You're biased. Yes, okay. Um, Thank you. <laughs> you have a question here. Ha- talk into this. Um, since, you're always, since you're always mobile and you need to be on the go, uh, what mm-hmm. is your photo kit like? Um, lights, anything that you use? What kind of gear do you use? Um, so... Okay, so uh, the photo agency I work with, they changed to Canon this year. Uh-huh. <laughs> so I use a 1DX. And, but like just with prime lenses and the 2470s, and I, I don't like use flashes or lights. I don't even know how they work. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, <laughs> you're, honest, you are, <laughs> I don't think that there's anybody more of a true photojournalist, documenta- oh, you. documentarian <laughs> than yourself. So, and most photojournalists don't necessarily use flash in these sorts of situations that you're typically shooting in but who knows in new york you might start i mean probably not i I use it as rarely as possible only when i have to so yeah do you do portraits at all i wish i can do it very good well 
I'm sure you can. <laughs> no, I, <laughs> I mean, want to learn some, it. <laughs> you've got some beautiful portraits that are, you know, more uh, environmental, accidental portraits, I'd say, but the, they're they're really good portraits. Well, um, I think that's where we'll end it. Um, again, thanks to Adorama and their event space. Thank you, Adorama. Thanks, yes, thank you, Adorama. <laughs> thank you to Canon Professional Services for your support. Thank you, Temba Bags, for your support as well. Um, if you like what you saw here uh, on uh, Facebook, please go to our Facebook page, hit like, um, give us a review while you're at it. That'd be awesome, five stars. Um, and uh, you'll be able to see more of, of the type of work that we do. So, Muhammad, I, I really appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Thank you. And everybody, we'll see you again next time. Take care.